Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. They continue to watch the numbers and in particular the number of patients in our intensive care units. Mayor Ron Nuremberg saying there has been a slowdown in the number of patients in the ICU in the last couple of weeks. The mayor says that number tracks with hospital admissions but warns we are peaking and need to do everything possible to keep our caseload from rising any higher. Tonight 1,166 people are in the hospital. 435 are in the ICU and 288 are on ventilators. We have 10% of staffed beds available. And when taking a look at the total number of COVID-19 cases, Bear County saw more than 500 new cases for a total of 31,867. 12 more deaths were also reported for a total of 274. More than 200 cases of positive COVID-19 have come from infants here in Bear County. Thankfully, none of those infants have died. One woman who recently gave birth described going into labor while being COVID-19 positive. The night team's Patty Santos tells us her story and the message UT Health doctors have for expecting women. I had the baby and I got to keep them, they didn't take them away. I was able to breastfeed. There was a sense of relief for Andrea Ochoa when she gave birth to a healthy baby at UT Health two weeks ago. I was just nervous for the baby. It, I was thinking maybe he's gonna get it. At 38 weeks, she noticed an earache, headache, shivers, and a runny nose. She doesn't know where she got the virus. Corona took everything that we look forward to, like the baby showers, uh, the family coming to the baby. Every woman who checks in for delivery at the hospital is tested for COVID-19, says Dr. Patrick Ramsey. So far, about 15 to 20 percent of OB patients are positive and about 85 percent have no symptoms. We have seen uh, several women women who have been very ill and uh, the solution was to deliver them to get the baby delivered. He says every woman is treated as positive until their tests return and strict PPE protocols are always followed. From a patient's perspective, uh, we look a little unusual coming in because we have our N95 masks on, we have our yellow gowns, uh, we've got gloves, we've got foot booties on and head, head, uh, head covers. Uh, so it's a little less personal. He says mothers who are positive have a say on whether their baby is removed from them at birth or not. Newborns are tested at birth and 48 hours after. Metro Health reports there are 211 positive COVID-19 cases involving children under the age of one. Dr. Ramsey says it's important that women take precautions before and after giving birth. If you have a newborn at home or you're late in your pregnancy, be careful of who's around you. Ochoa also has a message. Have a positive mindset and make sure you have a strong support system. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Metro Health says there has been an increase in pediatric cases. In May, the infection rate was 4.6% and now it's gone up to 11.2%. As school districts in and around the San Antonio area are faced with an evolving pandemic and having to adapt, Bernie ISD allowed parents to decide if students would attend class or learn online. Superintendent Dr. Thomas Price says so far they've seen 81% of parents choose to have their students learn in person. Bernie ISD, which is in the Kendall County, which is in Kendall County, set to begin school on August 12th. Bear County under a health directive announced by Metro Health, which forbids schools from reopening for in-person instruction until at least after Labor Day. Harlandale ISD says it will begin distance learning on August 24th. San Antonio ISD set to start on August 17th with distance learning. We have a list of dates and school openings on KSAT.com. And distance learning was one of the topics of a survey conducted by the UTSA Urban Education Institute. Nearly 2,000 teachers, students, and parents in our area took part. Dr. Mike Villarreal says in the survey, teachers expressed a difficulty maintaining a social and emotional connection with students when we are talking about distance learning. 60% of teachers said their students were less engaged in their studies Coming up, we're going to take your questions and our questions to Dr. Villarreal. The live discussion with Mike Villarreal is tonight's KSAT Q&A. It's coming up in about 30 minutes.
Well, tonight, an inside look at an undercover operation by the Texas Alcohol and Beverage Commission. Newly obtained video shows a crowded San Antonio nightclub just days before all Texas bars were ordered to be closed again. The night team's Jaffney Gray with the video and reaction from the club's owner. But I think every bar owner or everybody that's involved in the industry is literally hanging on for dear life. That's how Burn House Club owner David Amrola feels about the future of his business. He was excited after the reopening of Texas. We had everything in place for social distancing. Uh, we had our table six feet apart. On June 21st, TABC agents did an undercover operation in Burn House. In this video captured by one of the agents, people can be seen, some with masks and some without, dancing in close proximity of each other, which put the club in violation of social distancing guidelines. They were dancing at the tables, which, you know, from our understanding was still legal and that's not how they interpret it. A report also shows that security did check temperatures and instructed people to wear masks. The club was shut down, but Amrola says the case was dismissed after Governor Greg Abbott decided to reclose bars on June 26th. After losing some of the bar industry's very own to COVID-19, Amrola says he knows the virus is real and personally doesn't want to reopen. We don't want to get sick. We don't want to stop get sick. We don't want the public to get sick, but I think there needs to be some kind of reform or some kind of communication with us as to what our options could be. Without having those options, he feels the bar industry is being painted in a bad light. The, 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 the way that they're trying to demonize the industry and just say, oh, they just want to open, they don't care. That's not true. You know, we're, we're all human beings that are worried about our future, how we're going to be able to survive and, and support our families after this is all over. And Rolla says he hopes a compromise can be reached to give the bar industry a chance to survive. So everybody in this industry and everybody in this, uh, in this world is willing to, to adapt to what needs to be done to, to, to end this pandemic. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. You knew on the night, be police searching for the suspect in an east side shooting. It happened on the corner of Polaris and Crockett. Officers say two men were arguing when one of them shot a man in the leg. That man taken to the hospital. The suspect remains on the run tonight. It was a tight race, and now a week later, the lead appears to be growing in the Republican runoff for Congressional District 23. Tony Gonzalez was just seven votes ahead of Raul Reyes, but now the Gonzalez campaign says that has increased to a 23-vote margin. In a statement, his campaign says that Tony's margin of victory has increased now that most counties, including all of the largest counties in the district, have updated their results to reflect all votes legally cast, end quote. Gonzalez's opponent has not given up the race. On Facebook, Raul Reyes posted, quote, ballot canvassing through our 20, 29 county district has started this week with the deadline being Thursday, July 23rd, end quote. He also made mention of an effort for a recount fund. On the Democrat side, meantime, we have Gina Ortiz Jones, who won her March primary. This is a race to replace Representative Will Hurd, who is stepping aside at the end of his term. District 23 stretches from San Antonio to El Paso. He's being remembered as a hero who loved his job through the good and the bad. Timothy De La Fuente suffer, excuse me, served the Barrett County Sheriff's Office for 27 years. He died back in April from complications due to COVID-19. Today, a procession was held along with the service at Community Bible Church. Family members recalled De La Fuente's way of spreading joy through kindness and love. A show of support from San Antonio all the way to Houston tonight for firefighter Captain Leroy Lucio. He served here in the San, he lived out here in the San Antonio area, but actually worked in Houston. Captain Lucio also spent a month in a San Antonio hospital after becoming infected with the coronavirus, battling that illness for weeks before dying. San Antonio and Houston coming together for one of their own. I appreciate the help of the San Antonio Fire Department and Chief Hood. They have uh, provided everything that we've that we've asked for, and I can't say enough about the uh, support that the San Antonio Fire Department has given us in honoring our our captain. The captain Lucio, a 29-year veteran, is the first Houston firefighter to die from complications of COVID-19. The Houston Professional Firefighters Association says his passing will be classified as a line of duty death. 
A rescue caught on camera today. A worker trapped in a 10 foot deep trench pulled to safety. It took crews about two and a half hours to hoist him out of out on a stretcher. This happened on the northwest side of San Antonio at the intersection of Gom Road and Sway Back Ranch. That's located near Government Canyon. The fire chief of District 7 says it appears the 50 year old man was walking along the trench when a side caved in, causing him to fall in the hole. He ended up waist deep in dirt. Crews had to make sure there was no chance of another collapse before pulling the man out of the trench and taking him to the hospital. Today, another day below 100 for the high temperature. 98 was our high, the average being 95 and the record 102. And actually a little bit of rain out there as well, especially far west of town, just north of Del Rio. Uh, from about the Lakeview area to Comstock, that rain has largely come to an end though. We're tracking this area of disturbed weather underneath these uh, disturbed frames here. Yeah, is that what that is? <laughs> and there's, a, there's an arrow here pointing it toward Texas, so we'll talk how that could boost our rain chances coming right up, Steve. Thank you, Adam. Still ahead on the night, but he was pulled from the flames. The rescue from this burning boat. Look at that coming up. And a hack attack that prosecutors say involved research on the coronavirus. The charges that are now stretching overseas. Plus new details following the quick exit from Dr. Don Emmerich. The new records uncovered by the defenders. Next. The new details surrounding the fallout from San Antonio's former Metro Health Director. Records show other conflicts in her past. The defenders obtained records from Dr. Don Emmerich's service as public health director in Clackamas County, Oregon. She started in June of 2016. Documents show she then filed a complaint against the Health, Housing and Human Services Director in December of 2018, then announced her resignation the following month, with her last day being March 1st of 2019. Today, we learned Dr. Emmerich also left her position in Benton County, Oregon, before coming to San Antonio. But a spokeswoman said that exit was for personal reasons and emphasized Dr. Emmerich was not forced out. As we've reported here in San Antonio, emails detailed friction between Dr. Emmerich and Assistant City Manager Colleen Bridger, who used to be the Metro Health Director. Because Dr. Emmerich stepped down from the job within 100 days, the Mercer Group, which helped the city fill the Metro Health Director position, will help find her replacement for free. A hack attack involving research on the coronavirus. U.S. prosecutors say it was part of a massive global hacking operation involving two Chinese nationals. Authorities say it went on for more than a decade, but most recently involved American firms working on coronavirus treatment and vaccine research. The hackers stole terabytes of data from hundreds of targets establishing themselves as a prolific threat to U.S. and foreign networks. The two men are charged with 11 federal counts, including conspiracy to commit theft and trade secrets and aggravated identity theft. The charges represent the first criminal charges against foreign hackers going after coronavirus research. The President Donald Trump relaunching his coronavirus briefings. This is the CDC sounds the alarm that the number of cases in the United States might be much greater than we know. Nadia Romero with the latest from the White House. We're asking everybody that when you are not able to socially distance, wear a mask, get a mask. Uh, whether you like the mask or not, uh, they have an impact. President Trump urging Americans to mask up during his first coronavirus briefing since late April. Some areas of our country are doing very well. Others are doing less well. It will probably, unfortunately, get worse before it gets better. Something I don't like saying about things, but that's the way it is. It's the way it's what we have. This time not flanked by his task force health experts. I was not invited up. Dr. Burks is right outside. This as lawmakers spar over another aid package for Americans struggling during the pandemic. The Republicans are finally, finally feeling the heat to do another relief bill. I'm alarmed that we're talking about spending another trillion dollars we don't have. Now the CDC is reporting the number of infected Americans could be two to 20 
24 times higher than the reported case numbers. We think about 40% of these infections are without symptoms. And a new study is showing that if people follow these three simple behaviors, washing hands regularly, wearing masks, and keeping physical distance from others, it could mostly stop the COVID-19 pandemic, even without a vaccine or additional treatments. At the White House, I'm Nadia Romero reporting. Take a live look outside on this Tuesday evening. It's currently 87 degrees out there and a pretty nice day, Adam. Hot one, but pretty nice. Yeah, one thing yeah. to complain about. Mm. No, hey, we were under 100. Very good. Yeah. For, I believe, the third day in a row, fourth day in a row. Nice. <laughs> when you're talking about a streak of sub 100 days, that says something about what you've been through. We had eight consecutive 100 degree days and that streak came to an end over the weekend. So let's talk about the aquifer and really our need for rainfall. Of course, we do have a drought situation going on in a good portion of South Texas. The aquifer down again today. It's been on a steady drop. It's down seven tenths of a foot. The 10 day average is at 655.5. The importance of the 10 day average is because when that gets down to 650, that's when stage two watering restrictions will be in effect. Now we've had some pop up showers. Take a look at our rainfall today. Most of that was closer to Houston and even in parts of Southern Valverde County more recently this evening. Actually, uh, just north of Del Rio and just north of Lakeview, about two inches estimated by the radar. And over the past six hours, you see Edwards County, Real County, and then into Valverde County had those isolated showers, but some good downpours for some folks that just not a whole lot of people saw them, and then along the coastal plain, we've had a few lingering into Gonzales County over the past couple of hours. A ray of hope, though, for rain as we get into the weekend, more widespread rain. Okay, there's some hope for that, and that's because of a system that's moving into the eastern Gulf. There was good rainfall in other parts of Texas, especially east Texas here and stretching into Louisiana, parts of uh, north Texas as well had some good rain, but for us, we really need this batch of tropical moisture here moving through the Florida Straits. We need that to move its way into South Texas. And right now projections are that, that moisture is going to move here. It's just what kind of condition is it going to be in? That's the big question. It could even turn into a tropical depression or even a named tropical storm. There is that chance and the Hurricane Center is giving it a 40% chance of that over the Gulf of Mexico over the next five days. It wouldn't surprise me if these percentages went up just a little bit into tomorrow and Thursday. Regardless of what it is, and even if it has a title, it's going to have some moisture with it. And right now the trajectory would be to pull that moisture here into South Texas. So right now we're giving us the scattered rain chances by Saturday and maybe even lingering into Sunday. So right now uh, just some isolated showers pop popping up here and there Wednesday through Friday. And then we get into Friday night, but especially the first part of the weekend that we boost those chances to about 50 60%. It's one of those situations where we just need to keep a close eye on it. And of course, we'll be updating you accordingly. Also, there is tropical depression seven. This has nothing to do with that system moving into the Gulf. This is way out in the Atlantic, likely to become a tropical storm soon and by Sunday be in the Caribbean. So don't even worry about tropical depression seven right now. 87 degrees in the moment, dew point of 72, so it is sticky out there. Castorville's at 90, Canyon Lake at 86, along with Bandera, still 92 in Catula, 92 Laredo, Del Rio, little outflow boundary down to 85 right now. We go forward in time and I think we'll stay below 100, but pretty close to it on Thursday. What's a degree amongst friends? 99, 100. You don't really feel much of a change, but with that better chance of rain as we get into Saturday, I think a little closer to 90 degrees. Now tomorrow, it's just a 10 to 20% chance. A few of those rogue pop up showers, especially along the coastal plain. We'll start the day at 76, a mixture of sun and clouds and make it up to 97 into the afternoon. And there are those rain chances that get boosted again as we get into the weekend. We talked about it last night. We'll be fine tuning this forecast. We already have and we're excited to stay on top of this for you. Let's hope it materializes. Yeah, bring on the rain. Fingers crossed. Thanks so much, Adam. All right, you have the feeling that a lot of high school football coaches feel like they're relieved that at least it looks like they're going to actually play. Because that's a commitment by the UIO of having a high school football season during the COVID-19 pandemic and with the numbers rising. When we come back, the high school football season kickoff has been pushed back for over a month. Who is affected? We will tell you. And it looks like being in the bubble may be better odds for the Spurs to advance the playoffs. We'll explain coming up. The universe.
controversy, Interscholastic League has postponed the start of the high school football season in the state of Texas until September the 24th for all schools in Class 6A and 5A. The ruling delays the season for all the major school districts in the city and the surrounding area by five weeks in the middle of the soaring coronavirus outbreak in the Lone Star State and right here in Bear County. Class 6A and 5A schools such as Judson, Wagger, Brandeis, Brennan, Jefferson, Lanier, and Smithson Valley, just to name a few, cannot begin workouts until September the 7th, which is after Labor Day when they would normally hit the field on August the 3rd and cannot kick off games until September 24th. The UIL says there will be a full season with playoffs extended to accommodate the delay until January 2021. And volleyball in 6A and 5A cannot start until September 14th. Their matches, but all schools in Class 4A and below can begin on time August 27th. The good news is they're counting on a season. Outstanding. What an awesome day. You know, you wake up this morning and there's a lot of uncertainties, but with the UIL announcement today, and I want to give them all the credit for just being being very uh, adamant and, and, and proactive in trying to do what's best for the kids, and that's what it's all about. I'm just excited for our kids, uh, based on what the UIL's put out, to have them have an opportunity to play. Here's what the executive director of the UIL had to say in a statement. While understanding situations change, and there will likely be interruptions that will require flexibility and patience, we are hopeful this plan allows students to participate in the education-based activities they love in a way that prioritizes the safety and mitigates the risk of COVID-19 spread. The decision by the UIL today also affects the Brackenridge Eagles, who play in 5A. And for head coach Willie Hall, this will be his final season in coaching after 37 years at Brackenridge and the last 25 as their head football coach. Now he's seen it all. I was pretty excited to hear that uh, we are going to have a season, but at the end of the day, I, I still have some concerns, but I'm excited about the opportunity. I'm looking forward to it because it's my last, last go-round. Now, the UIL also ruled that Class 1A through 4A schools can start on time with workouts to begin August 3rd and the season on August the 27th, as originally planned. But the Somerset Bulldogs are caught between a rock and a hard place. They're the only 4A school, according to Somerset officials, that resides in Bear County and is also subject to the Metro Health ruling that seasons cannot begin until after Labor Day. That health order, due to the rise in the coronavirus cases in Bear County, supersedes what the UIL ruled today, or so they believe. Now what? It's kind of tough on us. It's a it's a rough deal because all of the other teams in our district, our competition district, can uh, they can start on August the third, and we'll be like seven games behind people when we actually get to a first ball game. There's really no good answer to it. There, uh, there's good answers for us. Better anything that would change for us would be a better deal than we've got now. All right, oddly enough, the Bulldogs are set to open up against the Brackenridge Eagles on August the 28th, which, according to the UIL, couldn't happen anyway, followed by Southside and McCullough, which are both 5A schools. Central Catholic is out on September the 18th due to the TAPS ruling, and the first school they could face would be Quero, who is in 4A on the 25th of September. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Washington's NFL team has hired former NBC anchor reporter Julia Donaldson to head the Washington Broadcast Department and appear on radio broadcasts. Her first woman in the NFL to be full-time inside a broadcast booth. She will carry the title of Senior Vice President of the Media, becoming the team's highest-ranking female executive. Now, this comes in the wake of the Washington Post report in which 15 women claimed sexual harassment and toxic workplace environment between 2006 and 2019. Donaldson will be in charge of hiring and new play-by-play -play voice for Washington after Larry Michael retired in the middle of the scandal. And right now, it doesn't look like there will be any NFL preseason games. We'll see about that. The Spurs go from a ping-pong to a cornhole tournament on their day off. Next. The Spurs taking the day off before one more team workout before they begin their scrimmages on Thursday against the Milwaukee Bucks. DeMar DeRozan is a Spurs leading scorer has already told us that he and his Spurs teammates are focused on making the playoffs. And even though they are four games back at the Memphis Grizzlies with just eight games to play in the restart of the 2019-2020 season, because they only have to make it to the ninth position to be part of the play-in format to make the postseason, do they feel they have new life? Just the fact that a matter of sitting out for months, not playing basketball, being able to come back and kind of have this opportunity, understanding other teams didn't have an opportunity to even play a basketball game. So for us to be in this position to go out there and compete and give ourselves a, a second chance throughout all this chaos that's been going on, and, and see what we could do. You know, um, we definitely feel energized. And during their day off today, the Spurs held a cornhole tournament instead of uh, ping pong, which they played over the weekend. We have two champions, newcomer Tyler Zeller and athletic development coach Kelly Forbes, who also won the ping pong tournament. 
So he must have some free time a lot to I know. He's gonna, play ping pong he's and gonna, all these other little sports. Yeah, ping pong, cornhole, and athletic development. I like it. Okay. I wish I had that job. Yeah, exactly. That <laughs> seems like a good gig. Yes. All right, Thank coming. You, Greg. Thanks, Craig. Coming up, it was a study on distance learning and its effectiveness. The director of the Urban Education Institute at UTSA, Dr. Mike Villarreal, was involved with that study. He joins us live for our Case Head Q&A next. So how do teachers feel about distance learning and a digital divide and going back to school? It's part of our KSAT Q&A tonight with Dr. Mike Villarreal. He is the director of the Urban Education Institute at UTSA. Mike, thank you for staying up late with us tonight. Uh, this is the first of several studies that I know you guys are going to release there. You've talked to teachers and parents and students. This is the teacher focused survey. How are teachers feeling about distance learning? And obviously it's gonna be much different in August than it was last March. That's right. Uh, it, that's a really important point to note. Uh, when we talk about distance learning, what we are really talking about uh, that what happened last spring was what we're calling now emergency <laughs> distance learning. It was a sudden and dramatic shift from in-class teaching to online. And, and our schools really weren't set up uh, for that. Uh, when In our survey, when we asked teachers, did you have any experience doing this before? Any kind of online teaching? And 95% said no. Uh, they, they had never done anything like this before. Uh, and at the younger grades, at the elementary level, only 1% of uh, our teachers had any kind of experience doing this. And so they turned out to be, number one, of course, very dedicated, hardworking. They, they made a Herculean effort to make this work last spring. Uh, it was a challenge from them. You know, interestingly enough, when you compare how they assess learning versus parents and students, they're actually harder on themselves than parents and students. And so that's a quick sneak peek for the, the next report that's coming out on students and parents. But that's a really important takeaway. Uh, our, our teachers really set high standards and they, they, they kind of plowed through it, but uh, it was difficult for them. And I'm, I'm happy to get into some of the, the difficult. Yeah, you, you mentioned some of those challenges. What were some of the things that teachers disliked about distance learnings and, and distance learning? And then talk to us about some of those challenges. Yeah, the, the biggest challenge that they uh, expressed um, and, and what they disliked most about distance learning was the lack of human connection with their students. And, and over and over in different ways, they went back to you know, this bond that they were able to establish in the classroom and in how they were able to use their relationship with their students to engage their students and hold their students accountable during the school year. One of the things they, they did say is that they, were, they felt blessed that they had a full fall semester and part of the spring to be able to establish that kind of relationship and going forward, if distance learning continues, they really were concerned about not having that kind of bond with the new crop of students that they're going to have this coming academic year. Mm -hmm. That was that is one recommendation they have that we have for school districts that that we heard loud and clear from our teachers. We need to figure out a way uh, to to allow them to have that some kind of connection with their students. For some, it might be one on one technology. But hopefully we can get to the point where fairly soon they're going to be able to have some kind of in-person, even if it's outside, uh, if it's very few students working in shifts, but have some kind of uh, personal connection with them. Didn't it kind of seem, seem like, I mean, you talked to uh, emergency distance learning, I think is how you put it in how you described what we went through. It doesn't seem as if anybody was especially satisfied with the way it went. And I guess it's because there was a lot of uncertainty in just simple things like grading, correct? That, that's right. It, it, there, there was um, uh, another, one of our top recommendations from teachers 
was the importance of setting a, a uniform policy and a clear message to students and parents uh, in terms of grading and accountability. And here's what we expect from you students and, and parents. Um, uh, there was a lot of mixed messages it last spring. Of course, you know, it was a sudden shift, but going forward, I think what we can uh, expect from our school districts is much more clear communication on what it takes to, um, you know, do your your side of, of uh, school for, for parents and for students. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but it, it wasn't it also centered more, the teachers felt it needed to be centered more on knowledge that the kids knew what they were doing than necessarily homework and homework assignments. That e it, it was different across different school okay. districts and and grade by grade it varied that some some schools really felt like let's focus on skills um, and let's change our grading system to mastery uh, giving students constructive feedback uh, some teachers uh, recommended you know using grades as a way of uh, kind of using a stick to get students in line. Uh, ultimately, uh, the, the recommendation from teachers was that we needed to have a grading system that really encouraged engagement and, and uh, constructive growth. And, and that would be a grading system that's more based on mastery and not a, a punitive function. You know, last time we spoke with you, and we have about a minute left in this interview, um, we talked about the digital divide and how deep that divide is here in our community. Are you getting a sense that that has changed either for better or for worse in these past few months? Mm -hmm. It's it's still very present. Uh, school districts have done an incredible job uh, based on our communication with parents and students of closing that digital divide. But we still see uh, a, about five to 10% of students not having access to technology to be able to engage uh, in their studies. And, and that's really important. Um, it's, it's also important to recognize having technology is only part of the answer. Having a quiet place to do your homework, having time to be able to engage in your studies is, is also really crucial and we see a lot of variability across our neighborhoods in San Antonio. So there's still quite a bit of inequity that needs to be addressed that our school districts are, are, are trying their best to do. And that will be part of the next study, correct? When you're talking to parents right. and students about what difficulties they're having with distance learning. And that should give us a better idea of just how big this digital divide is, correct? That, that, that's correct. And, and, and we also asked about some other basic needs like food scarcity. And, and so for example, uh, we found in some school districts, the percent of kids who said during the week we ran out of food and we didn't have enough money to buy more food, that figure is around 25%. Wow. And that's when you're talking about out of, that's something people sometimes don't think about with some of these school districts. When you're not having in-person classes, that's a couple meals that these kids aren't going to maybe have at home. That's right. And, and that population has grown considerably. We have a lot of parents who are out of work because of this pandemic. And so, you know, now more than ever, uh, we are realizing how uh, family circumstances matter. You know, it, it, you, you can set standards and expectations for students and teachers, but if a child's basic safety and security needs are not being met, it's really going to be hard for them to focus on the classroom. Yep. And that's, of course, something that we're going to have to have you back again, Mike. I'm sorry. We have to have you back to talk about the next study that comes with parents and students. I know you're going to be disappointed about having to talk to us about that again, but, you know, bear <laughs> with us. I know you are. Thank I'm just giving so you much. grief. Mike Villarreal with the Urban Education Institute at UTSA. Thank you for staying up late with us. Thank you. Thanks right. for coming. Bye -bye. Take care. We'll be right back. Around America tonight, take a look at this. A man saved from a burning boat on Lake Tahoe in California. Another boater saw the man needed help, was able to get to him safely. I don't know how he got to him. The Coast Guard arrived a short time later. A fire crew was able to extinguish the flames before that vessel sank in 21 feet of water. The man was taken to a local hospital but had no reported 
injuries. The backlash continues tonight over federal agents deployed onto the streets of Portland, Oregon to handle growing protests there. State and local officials there say these federal agencies are making the situation worse. This week, President Trump threatening to send federal officers to other major cities. Romina Puga has the latest. On Monday, President Trump threatened to send more federal law enforcement officers to cities around the country against the wishes of state and local officials. We're not going to let New York and Chicago and Philadelphia and Detroit and Baltimore and all of these. Oakland is a mess. He said have more federal law enforcement that I can tell you. Today, the White House defending its deployment of these federal officers to Portland, Oregon, where thousands of organizers have been gathering for eight straight weeks in front of a courthouse protesting police brutality and racial injustice. 40 U.S. Code 1315 gives DHS the ability to deputize officers in any department or agency. Quote, as officers and agents, they can be deputized for the duty of uh, in connection with the protection of property owned or occupied by the federal government and persons on that property. These individuals are organized and they have one mission in mind, to burn down or to cause extreme damage to the federal courthouse and to law enforcement officers. But the militarized crackdown by unidentified officers has drawn criticism. New video surfaced from a Saturday protest of a Navy veteran being beaten with a baton and pepper sprayed. He sustained two broken bones to his hand. I also want to use my 15 minutes to try to refocus this whole discussion back to Black Lives Matter as opposed to an old white guy who got beat up because I don't think I warrant the attention, to be perfectly frank. Mayors from across the country are now signing a letter requesting immediate removal of federal officers. They're accusing President Trump of using terror tactics. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio says they'll go to court to stop the president if they have to. Uh, from my point of view, this would be yet another example of illegal and unconstitutional actions by the president. Portland's mayor says it's just making the situation worse. Your presence here isn't wanted. It's not needed. It is clearly ratcheting up the violence and the vandalism. Two protesters who were arrested over the weekend were released with no charges filed. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. Take a look at live cam tonight. I got to tell you, I'm pretty excited about the rain chances Me out there. Me too. And that 90 degrees on, uh, what is it, Saturday? <laughs> the, the, the lawns are getting kind of crispy. Yeah. You're getting very, it's turned into a hay, basically, yes. on the side of my house. But yeah. eh, so be it. You know, we'll get a good rain at some point, and there is that potential as we get into the weekend. So the next couple of days, just a few little isolated pop-up showers possible, especially through Thursday, late Friday, then into Saturday. There's a ray of hope for some real beneficial and what could be some more widespread rainfall. All right, so let's talk about it. Taking a look at Texas and, of course, parts of the Gulf Coastline, there were some good showers, some good pockets of rain out there today. It just wasn't necessarily over us here in San Antonio or in our aquifer recharge zone, but you head eastward. Moving through the Florida Straits and into the eastern Gulf of Mexico, this area of active weather. This is a very broad area, which is good. We don't want it to become too organized because the more organized they become, the more concentrated the rain is in a smaller area. When they're really unorganized, they're kind of like kids with a messy bedroom. Just things kind of get thrown everywhere, and that's good. We want the rain to just kind of be thrown everywhere and want it to be widespread. But there is the chance that this will become more organized and maybe even gain a title of tropical depression or even a tropical storm. Over the next five days right now, that's a 40% chance as this moves westward. I think conditions are a little more favorable than that in the Gulf of Mexico. In terms of further de development, it wouldn't surprise me if it turned into a, a system with a tropical title. Time will tell. Either way, what it right now would bring to us is just some better rainfall chances. So right now in Lubbock, 73, 76 in Amarillo, still 92 in Laredo, 86 in Austin, and 87 here in San Antonio, measured at the International Airport, and 92 in Catula. Oh, we're feeling that humidity. Welcome to July in South Texas. Dew points already rebounding well into the 70s now, low to mid 70s. And tomorrow morning we'll start at 76. The typical few hours of some low clouds and then the, the patchy fair weather cumulus clouds the rest of the day. So mixture of sun and clouds, 
partly cloudy, whatever you want to call it. 97 by the afternoon, just a 10 to 20% chance of some of those isolated pop up showers. Thursday, rain chances not looking good. We'll be right near 100 degrees. And then we ramp up those rain chances a bit for now, up into the scattered category by Saturday and even lingering into Sunday as that area of active weather moves toward us and hopefully moves right overhead. Key factors here will be track and timing of that disturbance. The slower it moves, the better it is for us. Okay, All right, so hope for that. So we want it to be slow and disorganized. Exactly. Like a messy kid's room, there right? That's, I was going to say, and, and a kid asked to clean up. <laughs> that messy room is slow and disorganized. <laughs> yes. Still ahead, one retail giant looking ahead to its holiday schedule as it deals with the pandemic. The update from Walmart coming out. And TikTok says it's bringing some new jobs to several states, including Texas. But there could be some competition. The latest in your consumer headlines coming up. The pandemic has changed much of our daily lives. It's also led to some changes for companies. Walmart says it will close on Thanksgiving, saying workers stepped up during this year and they should enjoy the holiday with their loved ones. Shoppers often mark this holiday on calendars to get early Black Friday deals. Meanwhile, Walmart says it will give another round of bonuses. Full time hourly associates will get a $300 bonus on August 20th. Part time hourly and temporary associates We'll get a $150 bonus. New jobs are set to come to Texas. TikTok says it plans to create 10,000 jobs in the U.S. over the next three years. Those jobs would be based in our state, California, Florida, and New York. Those positions would include sales, content moderation, engineering, and customer support. The announcement comes as the company faces a rise of criticism over its handling of user data and its ties to China through its parent company. TikTok recently hired an American CEO and is considering a corporate restructuring. Meanwhile, Instagram is going for the TikTok crowd. The social media site is preparing to launch an alternative called Instagram Reels. Reels will let people record and edit 15 seconds of video set to music and audio. Users can then upload the videos to their stories and Instagram's Explore feature. Instagram has not given an official launch date for the new feature, but they are already testing the platform in India. The site is hoping to eventually expand to the United States and 50 other countries. There's been a spike in COVID related ripoffs and fraud. That's according to the Federal Trade Commission. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz gives us the rundown on the types of tricks to watch out for. As COVID-19 inundates hospitals and headlines, fraud is piling up too. Callie Davidson got a notification that a purchase was made at a nearby Target. The problem? I'm like, hmm. I'm not at Target. Identity theft is thriving, but way beyond credit cards. The FBI reports a spike in fake unemployment claims too. Unfortunately, scammers are very creative and they come up with all sorts of ways to prey on people in the middle of a pandemic. The Federal Trade Commission has some 59,000 complaints related to coronavirus or stimulus scams with losses of more than $74 million. So consumer beware, phony remedies. No cures or vaccines have been approved to treat COVID-19, but fraudsters are selling teas, oils, and intravenous vitamin therapies. Stimulus scams, beware calls or emails that use the word stimulus and ask for your social security number. Shady sellers, fake websites, set up to sell high demand stuff like masks and hand sanitizer. Work from home offers. Beware paying up front for materials. Jobs should pay you. COVID contact tracing scams. They need info, but not accounts or money. And phishing scams. Be skeptical of websites that have coronavirus or COVID-19 in their domain name. People need to be very vigilant against sharing personal information if they did not initiate the contact. To protect yourself, do a simple Google search with your subject and the word complaint or scam. Bottom line, be skeptical of any email, call, or text that wants something from you. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. It's still ahead the gift of life and how one woman was given the chance to be a mother. It's next on the Night Beat.
KSAT community partner University Health System wants to know why you wear a mask. It's part of a campaign to encourage others to help slow the spread of COVID-19. With infection rates and hospitalizations increasing, it's important to act now. You can join in the, on the campaign to share your pictures of you wearing your mask and tell us why you wear your mask. We have the link to where you can upload your picture and directions on how to participate and invite others to join in on the effort at ksat.com. Saw you with a uh, Thermometer yes, Thursday a mask there. Yeah, Thermometer Thursday. An Army veteran injured in the Iraq war has moved into his new mortgage-free home in Wimberley. Sergeant David Guzman lost his ability to use his right foot, suffered hearing damage in 2004. He applied to the program called Homes for Our Troops 18 months ago. His family is now the proud owner of an ADA compliant home that features a walk in shower, drop down shelves and a bath that will specifically help his leg. Guzman says he'll have freedom in his own home. And check this out, a woman born without a uterus has given birth to a baby boy thanks to a transplant. Michelle and her husband were going to adopt when she read about a uterus transplant procedure. After an in-depth screening process, a 14-hour transplant surgery, and a six-month recovery, Michelle was ready for an embryo transfer, which worked on the first try. Mm. Michelle says knowing someone else's uterus helped her bring baby Cole to life is the best thing in the world. Look at that cutie. And I'm not talking Aww. about Caskey, I'm talking about the baby. <laughs> <laughs> just to clarify, I want to be very just clear. Once, I want to be very just clear once. there. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, we'll be under 100 here for the next seven days. Better rain chances by the weekend. Have a great night. Night.